Hi Gators and welcome back! In today's video, we will be exploring the life of Rosemarie Nitrivit, whose death caused a scandal in Germany and gave rise to a novel, three movies and a musical. Let's have a listen. Maria Rosalia Auguste Nitribit, or Rosemarie as she called herself, was born on February the 1st, 1933 in Düsseldorf. Düsseldorf is the state capital of North Rhine-Westphalia and considered an international business and financial center, while also being famous for its fashion and trade fairs. But Rosemarie grew up in the Düsseldorf of the Wirtschaftswunder, when the city looked quite different. Wirtschaftswunder, or in English, the miracle on the Rhine, describes the rapid reconstruction and development of the economies of West Germany and Austria after World War II. The popular city was a target of strategic bombing during the war, and particularly during the RAF bombing campaign in 1943, when over 700 bombers were used in a single night. Raids continued late into the war, and Düsseldorf suffered enormous damage, with over three quarters of its center wiped from the map. Despite this tragic part of its history, Today, Düsseldorf is considered one of Germany's richest cities, and it boasts a population of some 620,000. So Rosemarie was born out of wedlock and likely never met her father, who worked as a laborer in the city and refused to pay for child support. Instead, she spent her childhood living in poverty with her mother, who was 18 and worked as a cleaning lady, and two half-sisters. They would eventually move to the smaller town of Rattingen, some 12 kilometers or 7.5 miles from Düsseldorf. In 1936, when Rosemarie was just three years old, the Düsseldorf Youth Welfare Office assigned her to an orphanage, due to her mother's reckless behavior and incapability to properly care for her. Her mother would eventually serve several prison sentences for undisclosed crimes. Rosemarie would spend three years at the orphanage and the carers would describe her as an extremely difficult child. She had behavioral problems and always seemed to find different ways of causing havoc. Bear in mind, she was four and five years old and that is an extremely young age to have been exposed to such a toxic and unhealthy environment. But being such a rebellious child, Rosemarie managed to escape the orphanage several times, and every time she did, she was brought right back. In 1939, when she turned six years old, she was then ready to meet her foster family in Mendig, a titsy tiny town that is home to a former military airbase, and not much else. For the next six years, everything will be pretty great. Rosemarie enjoyed a normal, healthy upbringing at her foster home, and she flourished into a happy little girl. But when she turned 12 years old, her past behavior began to resurface, just around the time that the Unified Armed Forces of Germany arrived in town. She would begin to act out, have terrible mood swings, and be generally very unhappy. And this is a girl that had just learned how to be part of a normal family. So what happened? Well, Rosemarie later told her foster family that an 18-year-old soldier had taken advantage of her when she was only 11 years old. And with them now back in town, she was feeling very anxious and scared. Now you think, okay. So her family went to the police and he was arrested. But no. Those were different times, and I know I say this a lot, but this wasn't any kind of soldier, and it definitely wasn't any kind of army. What had happened to her was never reported to authorities, despite everyone in town knowing who he was and what he did. And this was where Rosemary's childhood would come to an end. When Rosemary was in her teen years, she befriended two ladies of the night who offered to help her get on her own feet. They put her in touch with a few French soldiers in the area and Rosemarie would service them frequently, 
earning her enough money to get by on her own. She then moved to Koblenz and eventually to Frankfurt am Main, where she changed things up and attempted to try her hand at a normal life again. She worked first as a waitress and secured the odd job as a model on the side. Modeling was actually Rosemary's dream job. She really wanted to make it big and hopefully make a better future for herself. But old habits die hard and modeling jobs were hard to come by. So she soon went back to her old ways of offering herself up for money. At this point, Rosemary was still underage and a local youth welfare center who had heard of her new profession decided not to give up on her. So they went looking for her, driving up and down the streets of Frankfurt until they eventually brought her into a so-called re-education facility. Obviously, she was pissed and decided that she's going to break out again. And she did, multiple times. The first time, she escaped back to Düsseldorf, far away from this facility. And when they caught her again, she escaped back to Frankfurt. And this would soon turn into a cycle. From April 1952 to April 1953, she stayed at the Rheinischen Landesarbeitsanstalt Brauweiler in Pulheim. But at the age of 19, Rosemarie decides that she's had enough of being treated like a prisoner and she informs the welfare office in writing that she no longer wishes to be there. At that time, the legal age was 21, so Rosemarie hired a lawyer and ensured him that seeing as she is already employed as a waitress in Frankfurt's train station district, she was more than capable of taking care of herself. And less than three months following her appeal, she succeeds and becomes a free woman. The petite lady then rents a room in a middle-class inner-city location and does everything in her power to hide her background. She learned English and French, took classes in etiquette and adopted a miniature poodle she named Joe. But despite trying so hard to be happy, she often found herself unhappily in love with men who wouldn't return her feelings. While living in Frankfurt, Rosemary engaged in many short-lived affairs, specifically with dark-haired young men, she had a type, and sometimes even with women. In 1954, one suitor gifted her an Opel Capitan, which was an unusual car for a woman in her early 20s to be seen in. Other suitors invited her on vacations to the Mediterranean, among her lovers was a much older Turkish man that would send her a lot of money, take her on lush trips abroad and lavish her with love letters. He would unfortunately die of a heart attack in 1955 when the two were in San Remo, Italy. From that moment onwards, when she was just 22 years old, she would live exclusively off of selling her services. At night, she would call herself Rebecca and used Rosenbaum as a surname to embellish her persona. Rebecca is beautiful, confident, and always dresses in the latest fashion. She doesn't wait for customers to find her, but she pursues them herself, guaranteeing that the catch of the day is worth her time. And to do so in a stylish manner, she had to ditch the old Opel for a better model, a black Mercedes-Benz 190 SL with red leather upholstery, which she bought in 1956. That year, Rosemary earned an astounding 90,000 German mark, which was an incredible income for a single woman of that time. To compare, building a single family home cost about 25 to 30,000 mark, so our girl was doing very well for herself. In her new ride, Rosemary would then drive down the Kaiserstrasse past the Frankfurter Hof, one of the country's most luxurious hotels, and wait for any man dripping in money. She would then park up, roll down her window, and play super loud music to set the trap. Once her prey was in the net, she'd take them to her trendy apartment on Stiefstrasse 36. And this strategy worked. Rosemary became known throughout Frankfurt as the woman in the black Mercedes. And she became very wealthy very fast. 
But despite her job's reputation, Rosemary reveled in her profession. She was neither shy nor ashamed of it, but rather celebrated intimacy and being a seductive, independent woman that could get what she wants. And she'd flaunt her luxurious lifestyle any chance she got. You go, girl. Later, as her popularity grew, and boy did it, she would arrange these home visits over the phone. And this is important, only with men she knew. The password to enter her apartment complex was Rebecca. But despite becoming a rich woman in only two years, money wasn't what Rosemary desired deep down. Rosemary, like many of us, was just a woman from a broken home that wanted to be loved, she wanted security, she wanted to feel safe. And she craved intimacy. She talked about marriage, children, a house in the country. Friendships, particularly, meant a lot to Rosemary, and she always made sure to keep them and her clientele separate. Many times, she'd ask her suitors for 200 flowers or for some petrol money. But at the same time, she was also okay with a 50 mark note. It wasn't all about money for her. She was also known to dismiss her young lovers after only a few weeks. She had a tendency to grow tired of the superficiality of it all, because she longed for something deeper. Rosemary was also openly afraid of her more violent customers, and of their jealous wives, so she'd always hide a microphone in her vase. Just a few weeks prior to her death, she said to a friend over champagne at the Bad Homburg tennis bar, at some point, someone will crack my head open. Rosemary was a smart cookie, and very aware of the dangers of bringing her clientele home. And it was around this time, three years after having lived this lifestyle, that she began to think about breaking out of it. She also voiced this to a friend, that she could picture herself working a simple job, living a regular life. Then. On November the 1st, 1957, police are called to Rosemarie's apartment. Her cleaning lady had apparently attempted to enter apartment 41 for three days straight, but failed. This was strange because Rosemarie was known to be very reliable. She planned everything to a T. For instance, when police arrived, they noticed a lot of bread that had been delivered to her door and that Rosemary had clearly never picked up. But whenever she traveled, she would always cancel all of her deliveries. Either way, the neighbors ignored the dog's barking, and instead, the cleaning lady ended up being the one to report the crime. That day, at 4.50 p.m., two police chiefs, Heinz Müller and Heinz Gouvernator, had the door of the apartment opened by a locksmith. They turned on the light in the dark living room and saw that the tenant was lying dead on the parquet floor. Rosemary had been strangled to death with a pink nylon stocking that was still draped around her neck. There was also a cut on her head. Following an autopsy, it was determined that she had been dead for at least a couple of days, which makes sense given the amount of bread outside her door. Police then noticed that the floor heating was on, and they thought that the perpetrator intentionally left that on and turned it up as high as possible, so that her body would decompose quicker and evidence would disappear. And it worked. Her body was already in the early stages of decomposing. Because it was so piping hot in the apartment, police decided to go against protocol and open a window. And they did this before taking Rosemarie's temperature, which inevitably led them to destroy evidence of her exact time of death. Seriously, dumb and dumber. At first glance, the police noticed very few details, before somehow concluding that randomly moving stuff around would be a wise choice. So they moved the odd object here and there, and in doing so, again, tampered with evidence. Even the notes they scribbled down were vague and inefficient at best. And this was a substantial amount of money back then. Despite this, the apartment was super tidy and nothing appeared to be out of place. 
all of Rosemarie's luxurious belongings were left untouched. Even her authentic fur coats were still in her wardrobe. Then again, if they came on foot, they're hardly gonna walk out of there with ten fur coats looking like fucking Wolverine. Anyway, police briefly spoke to some neighbors. One of them claimed to have heard a loud scream, followed by a heavy thud, akin to someone falling on the floor, on October the 31st at 3.30 p.m. In 2014, the Westdeutsche Allgemeine Zeitung, a contemporary newspaper, published unreleased police files on Rosemarie's case. And they revealed that the police had found a broken red wine bottle, which had a set of unidentified fingerprints on it. Didn't lead to anything though, because, you know, inefficiency. Further to this, they came across a recording device hidden in her music chest. On one of the recordings, one can hear Rosemarie greet someone at the door and offer them a glass of brandy. Only moments later, you can hear Rosemarie scream, let go of me, let go of me. And then, the recording stops. But that's not all the file contained. It also revealed the names of four of Rebecca's regular clients, and they were all members of Germany's high society. Among them was Harald von Bohlen und Halbach. Harald was the heir of Krupp about to inherit a ridiculous fortune. At the beginning of the 20th century, Krupp was the largest company in Europe and Germany's main weapons manufacturer in both world wars. Make of that what you will. Anyway, Harald was obsessed with Rosemarie. He'd send her letters, call her cute names, and list every damn present he'd ever bought her in those letters. He decorated her apartment with the most expensive paintings, gifted her jewelry, pearl earrings, porcelain horses, a hat and a toolbox. An actual toolbox, so random. Rosemarie's other customers were the billionaire entrepreneur Harald Quandt and the industrial sons Ernst Wilhelm and Gunther Sachs. All of them were, of course, investigated, but the investigation was all over the place and none of their alibis were actually that closely checked. The issue here was the social status these men enjoyed, and that, paired with Rosemarie's somewhat scandalous profession, ultimately resulted in a sloppy approach to solving this case. Some files were completely destroyed so that no family names would feature, and all the leads that the police actually had were readily ignored. Today, it is largely believed that police were paid off by high society members, and given Rosemarie's occupation, the police were more than happy to comply. She was never worth the time anyway, so to speak. Authorities did, however, briefly suspect a Heinz Pohlmann, a prominent friend of Rosemary's. It was found that he had paid off some of his gambling debt shortly after her murder. More specifically, he paid off around 18,000 mark, the exact amount that had been taken from her apartment. Heinz was of course immediately considered a murderer and arrested. However, police lacked the evidence to convict him and he was then released in July of 1960 by the District Court of Frankfurt. The media of that time would describe Rosemarie as a woman of the night that couldn't even write, let alone read, which couldn't be further from the truth. But the public was more interested in gossip rather than reading about an educated, confident woman who read books by Marcel Proust and Stefan Zweig and tragically lost her life through no fault of her own. And to paint a picture of how intelligent this lady really was, French writer Marcel Proust wrote the world's longest book called A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, which has an impressive 1.2 million words in it. That's double the amount of War and Peace. So to claim that she was illiterate was and is outrageous. Unfortunately, there is not much more police have disclosed. And seeing as this case took place in the 50s, I doubt there ever will be. It's sad to hear about the woman that went through hell and back and still had enough hope and zest for life to dream of a better future, being murdered so heartlessly. 
We as a society need to stop looking down on people based on their profession, background or beliefs. None of us are perfect and kindness goes a long way. With that being said, thank you for listening to her story and I hope to see you back soon. Ciao ciao!